One thing evolutionists won't discuss is the fact that the word evolution actually has six definitions. Number one, cosmic evolution. The origin of time, space, and matter with the Big Bang. Number two is chemical evolution. The origin of higher elements beyond hydrogen and helium. Number three is stellar and planetary evolution. The origin of the stars and the planets. Number four is organic evolution. The origin of life from non-life. Number five is macroevolution. The changing from one kind of animal to another kind. And number six, microevolution, variation within the kinds. Of those six definitions, only one of them, microevolution, has ever been observed. But that doesn't stop evolutionists from pretending they're all one thing. It's just part of their propaganda machine. I had to investigate. Cutting right to the chase, there is actually only one definition for the word evolution, and that is change over time. Any other definition is simply a context. One of those contexts is a theory that the observed morphological changes in organisms are due to changes in allele frequencies resulting from random mutation and natural selection. This is the theory first proposed by Charles Darwin in his often cited, rarely read work on the origin of species. In the years since the publication of this work, the mechanism of random mutation has been proven to manifest morphological changes which have been artificially selected by human beings. The theoretical part is that in nature, the propensity of some mutations to improve the overall fitness of an individual also gives it a reproductive advantage in whatever ecological niche it may occupy. This will probably never be proven, but we can make predictions based upon this assumption. The idea that all life on Earth is somehow related, albeit distantly, is known as the theory of common descent. In the modern synthesis of the theory of evolution, it is the previous mechanisms of random mutation and natural selection which have manifested these increasing chasms between species. This leads us to taxonomy. The first scientifically useful method of taxonomy was proposed by Carolus Linnaeus. In pursuit of the biblical kinds, Linnaeus examined countless species. Once he determined distinct species, he began to notice morphological similarities which unified species under various genera. He then noticed similarities in various genera and grouped them into orders, then classes, phyla, and even kingdoms. Each of these clades has been revised by the addition of subclades and superclades as the variety within them has become more and more apparent. In the end, the only truly observable clade was species, being any group which can genetically reproduce, excluding all others. This is where the concept of microevolution applies. On several occasions, however, two populations of the same species have been observed to drift far enough genetically from each other that they are no longer able to reproduce. This is what is known as speciation. Any genetic change from that point on is above the species level, which is what is scientifically known as macroevolution. Genetic evidence being commonly used to establish relationship between between individuals can also be applied to different species. As a result, confirming the genetic relation of species has actually redefined some clades. While scientists try to adhere on some level to the Linnaean taxonomic clades, morphological similarities simply don't construct a complete picture as, after all, these morphological details are merely the result of the genes that produce them. For example, due to morphological similarity, bats had always been considered to be close relatives of primates. Genetically, however, they are much more closely related to Horses. For reasons like this, the Linnaean classification system is known to be incomplete, yet it is still used, albeit in a modified fashion better representing the genetic rather than morphological evidence. Strangely, this really required few modifications. Assuming the theory of common descent, we can use the modified taxonomic system to predict where we should expect to find specific fossils. For example, Edward B. Deschler of the Academy of Natural Sciences, Neil H. Shubin from the University of Chicago, and Harvard University professor Farish A. Jenkins Jr. were able to predict ahead of time where they should expect to find a fossil of a creature which appeared to have wrist bones similar to tetrapods and yet rays similar to ray finned fishes with spiracles in the head which would be indicative of a lung system in addition to a pectoral girdle separating the head from the body with a neck. They predicted that this morphological combination of tetrapod and fish-like traits would be found in Devonian strata on Ellesmere Island, Nunavut, in northern Canada and after five years of excavation found no less than three individuals matching those exact traits. These individuals were named Tiktaalik. Now maybe the theory of common descent is wrong, but if it is, it's quite coincidental that it has repeatedly made these kinds of predictions both genetic and paleontological. One prediction not made by common descent is the changing of one kind into another. Actually, it's quite the opposite. The first animal cell, 
is still a member of the eukaryote domain. When the first notochord appeared in a creature, it may have become the first chordate, but it was still an animal, and therefore a eukaryote. The first mammal never stopped being a chordate, nor did the first primate ever stop being a mammal. When a population of primates lost their tails and became increasingly sexually dimorphic, they may have gained the distinction of being apes, but they remained primates. When a population of great apes began to walk upright, we may recognize them as our hominid relatives, but they remain apes, just as we do to this day. This is the overall phenomenon of macroevolution. It bears no resemblance whatsoever to the creationist definition. To change clades would actually disprove the theory of common descent and would not be macroevolution at all. This is where the theory of evolution ends. It has nothing to do with the origin of life and makes no predictions about it. It doesn't even predict whether life formed before or after evolution began. In fact, every other application of evolution in the creationist argument is simply the assertion that things change over time. And, in fact, they do. The idea that non-living chemicals over time amalgamated into polymers which could reproduce, metabolize outside chemicals, and react to stimuli while developing some system of inheritance is called abiogenesis. It certainly qualifies as some sort of organic evolution, but the terms are far from synonymous. You'll note that abiogenesis is a hypothesis, not a theory. But like any other hypothesis, it makes a prediction. This prediction is that the constituent characteristics of life can appear naturally. As shown in episode 11, this this prediction is confirmed by experiment as well as observation. When Louis Pasteur conducted his experiments, he was not addressing abiogenesis. He was refuting the idea of spontaneous generation of fully formed life. In the centuries since, scientists have observed that there is no distinct line between living and non-living material. There appears to be a gradient. There are even polymers for which scientists and even creationists are unable to decide whether or not they constitute life. For example, viruses and prions, both of which have some, but not all of the characteristics which define life as we know it, including evolving alleles. It is also an observable fact that planets and stars do change over time. We can call this evolution, but that doesn't mean we are adding a new definition to the word. The theories about stellar and planetary formation are direct consequences of Newton's laws as well as Einstein's general theory of relativity. Other than at the quantum level, these propositions are the concepts behind nearly everything you do today. These laws are responsible for the fact that you have a cell phone or a computer or can even access something like the internet. They have allowed humans to go into space and land on the moon. So applying these same equations in much simpler fashion to the coalescing of large amounts of hydrogen into stars is hardly a stretch of credibility. Nor is it a stretch of any of Newton's laws nor Einstein's laws to apply them to what happens at the center of stars. We actually apply these laws here on Earth and are also able to create heavier and heavier elements. So it appears that chemical evolution is not only observed, but actually repeatable. But again, the definition of evolution continues to be change over time. The Big Bang would certainly be a change over a period of time, but to call this cosmic evolution would be unfairly vague as even the creationist account from Genesis is a change in the universe over time, albeit over only six days. So the term applies equally to creationism and the Big Bang. The difference between the two, once again, is the predictions they make. Applying Newton's laws and Einstein's theory of relativity to the Big Bang, there should have been a point in time when the universe was impenetrable to radiation released by the energy of the Big Bang. Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman published around 1950 that if the universe had since become transparent to this radiation, the Big Bang predicted that we should be able to detect a microwave background radiation originating from all directions. In the 1960s, Robert Dickey, Orno Penzias, and Robert Woodrow Wilson successfully discovered and measured this background radiation. Depending on the distance of the source, this radiation could be seen to have redshifted in accordance with predictions made by Edwin Hubble and originally George Lemaitre. In any case, there is only one definition for the word evolution. Although there are countless contexts for the word, there is only one scientifically accepted theory of evolution. Anytime the word is co-opted into a creationist argument in a context that is not a consequence of changing alleles, it is dishonestly conflating two separate ideas. As I said at the start of this series, I am appropriating the word evolutionism to mean the scientific consensus. In doing so, I am both making up a word and misapplying it for the sake of being able to meet creationists on their own terms. Hopefully, common terminology will allow them to see how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. 
it may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.